the internet this morning and receiving the message. And Lord, we just also thank you for our pastor, and uh, we, just, we just thank you enough for him, Lord. And we ask this morning that you bless his message. Uh, let the Holy Spirit um, dwell in him as he presents this message, that we may understand it and be able to share it with others that are searching and longing for the love of Jesus Christ. And we give you all the praise and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Um, in case you didn't get the word, we moved the bonfire to this Saturday at 6 o'clock. It was a little breezy yesterday, so uh, we didn't think that was a very good idea. If you're planning on coming to the bonfire, um, I ask that if you would please let Pastor or one of us know. We just want to kind of get a feeling by the end of the week of how much, you know, food to get and everything. and and uh, bring your lawn chairs because we can spread out around the, the fire. So that's on the bonfire. All right, turn in your hymnals. <laughs> you don't know how excited I am about that. <laughs> to page number 10. And let's tell God how great he is. We'll do all four verses. Yeah. 
Okay, and if you'll turn to page 187, we'll do all three verses of In the Garden. sound good. Okay. I don't have to tell any of you that this has been a strange year. <coughs> really? <laughs> okay. So, um, and it comes and goes, I'm sure, for everybody. But I've kind of had a heavy heart this week. And uh, through my Bible study, this scripture stood out to me, and it kind of leads into our special. 
But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. It is well with my soul. Blessed. 
Well, I was thinking. Okay, where's my man? <laughs> Okay, I was thinking about uh, on the 4th when I titled our message uh, about do-overs, and I said that I didn't want to have too many do-overs in life. Well, I started thinking about that, and I wanted to make sure that every one of us knows that God will give us as many do-overs as it takes and that we should never forget that he is that merciful. So uh, as an example of that, I would even go as far as this. It doesn't even matter what type of failure we do, that God will give us a do-over. So today I've titled this message, Failure is Not Final, If. And the reason... I say if it's because we have to do something to keep it from being a failure. And we're going to be in the book of Luke this morning. I think we have a perfect example uh, found here in Luke chapter 22. Uh, I was thinking about the Olympics, how every four years they had these games that I realized that 90% of the people did not even win a prize during them times. And I think about how many times in my life that things didn't go the way I wanted them to go, and that things at work didn't go as I wanted it to go. And uh, I wanted to do good, but something bad happened. And, you know, Paul told us, he says, my body strives to do good, but it still does bad. And I was thinking about that. And then I had my eyes open up to remember that there's such a, a love in our lives. Take marriage for an example. Sometimes marriage ends up in tears. But remember the day of the wedding? Groom, the first time you turn your head around and seen your bride in her white, beautiful gown. And you think about that. Or maybe parents, that newborn child, the first time you get to see him. Now, I told you before, when Kenny was born, I thought he was ugly, so I wanted to do over <laughs> But he, he turned out to be pretty amazing. So I started thinking about this. How many times the Bible have given us people that has failed from Genesis even into Revelations? But, you know, we don't remember their failures because all these people had great events come in their lives and we remember them. Look at Abraham. Look at Lot. Look at David. I mean, I could start naming all of them. Daniel was the same way. And, and, and think about even Joseph. You know, I thought about him. Uh, you know, how the Lord took something bad and made something good out of it. And that's exactly what God promises he'll do. He'll take something bad and turn it into good. So this morning as we look here, I want to look at some of the failures and how God turned them around to be useful, but I want to show you a plan that failure is not final if you do four steps, and I'm going to share them with you today. Uh, before, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to have you stand as I read God's Word, but I'm going to pray here, so we'll be in Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> Father, we thank you this morning for your Word, and we ask an anointing and a blessing over it. We ask for a clear understanding, Father. Your word tells us that if we want wisdom, that we shall ask for it. 
And Father, we ask that you will give us wisdom of your word. We apply it into our lives and to the lives of other people. That we may do the Great Commission and go and make disciples and baptize them and train them up. And then get them equipped and ready to go out to, to win souls for Jesus. And this morning, Father, we heard some beautiful messages how great you are. And Father, how much you loved us that in the garden is when we're told how much you love us. And Father, you told us that it will be well with our souls if we trust you. So today, Father, I ask you that you would speak to and through me, your servant. That you would change lives today. Give us a message that someone out there who's struggling, thinking that I'm such a failure. There's no way God could even look at me. But Father, I have great news for that person. Jesus loved that person enough to die for them. So yes, they are worth it. And Father, we're going to celebrate that today as we share your word about our failures is not our final act. And I thank you and give you glory and praise that you're a merciful God, that you give us grace and forgiveness. And that your love covers a multitude of sins. For we ask in Jesus' name. And amen. Luke records it this way, starting in verse 54. Starting in verse 54, he said, Having arrest him, meaning Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intensely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour had gone by and passed, and, a, and another confidentially affirmed, confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the roast, rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Thank you. You may be seated. That's a very well-remembered story. We remember that failure of Peter, but we also know what God does with this. So as Peter... Let us understand this. Peter had betrayed Jesus after the arrest from the garden. And remember in the garden what Jesus had done. He prayed that the Lord will take away this cup for him. He prayed for his disciples and then he prayed for us. And then right after that we know that uh, in verse 54 it said, Having arrested him, they led him into the high priest's house. But the key thing that we need to look at is that Peter followed at a distance. And, and, and I looked at this and I started thinking about those words. Jesus was arrested. He's hauled off to the high priest. And yet Peter is following them as well. And we know that he follows them not only up to the courtyard, but in the courtyard. Matter of fact, he makes his way up to the fire to make himself warm. And we need to be careful not to start judging Peter because of what is about to happen. And many people did, including Peter. 
Uh, the story of the rest was all over now. People were talking about it. And in Luke twenty-two fifty, 50, it said, When the authorities came to arrest Jesus, that one of them took out the sword and cut the ear off of one of the people arresting them. And we know who that was. It was Peter. And Jesus just graciously picked up the ear and ding, ding, it's back there. And I wonder if he went, baby, you know, like some of them TV evangelists that does that once they claim to heal somebody. But Jesus didn't have to do that, did he? That man knew immediately his ear was reattached and all that was working because he knew something changed his life. He was touched by Jesus. Remember when you was touched by Jesus? It starts getting me goosebumps thinking about them time. But I want you to know that I really believe at that moment when Peter cut off that servant's ear, that he would have died for Jesus that moment. I really believe that with all of my heart, that he would have fought till death because he had all the boys around him. Jesus was in the presence. And when he was in the presence of Jesus, he knew he can do mighty things. And Jesus turned and put that sword away, and there was no need for that. But as we are told that he followed as a distance, and some recordings will share with you that a lot of the disciples followed at a distance. And probably some of the women followed at a distance as well to see what happened to Jesus. If you ever watch the TV remakes of this portion of the scripture, you see the women coming in, but they stop. Everyone stops at the courtyard, except Peter. Peter goes on. And I had someone tell me one time, well, that's because Jesus had prophesied what was going to happen. Yes, he did. But Peter could have changed the prophecy prophecy if he would have stayed outside of the the courtyard with the rest of the disciples and the women who had been following Jesus all this time but Peter went in he went to distance and he was in there now not only did he go in the courtyard he snuggled right up to the fire that's my kind of guy if it's a cold night out guess what I'm going to the fire and if I have to nudge somebody <laughs> If I'm really cold, I might nudge you. But it says that Peter went right up to the fire, was warming himself when this lady looked at him intensely and probably looked him in the eye and said, you're one of those. But I think it took courage for Peter to walk in the courtyard, wiggle up to the fire, because the fire was close to the entrance into the priest's house in his courtyard. So as you're thinking about this, he stayed there even when this lady accused him. He denied it. He said, woman, I do not know him. So I, I, I thought, what kind of powerful words are that? It sounds like a little kid, you know. Johnny, did you do that? Not me, Mom. I didn't do that, you know. That's kind of what it sounded like to me. But when I studied into the, the, the original Greek about that word, him say, not I, uh, it meant not a personal pronoun, but the action of the verb. It literally meant not I know him, not I, I don't know him. And it's a little personal when you think of that. It's taken that way, and it's that personal uh, relation that he had with Jesus at the time. So he sat there and he said that to this woman, and he probably said it loud enough for everyone around the fire to hear, I don't know him. But then a little while later, it says that um, a man said that he was certainly he was one of those because he's a Galilean. Well, just because of the way he dressed and the way he looked, he was accused of being that. But if we look in Matthew 26, uh, verse 73, it said a little while later, who, when he stood up and Peter said, he said to Peter, surely you are one of those. 
And this is what Matthew says, because your speech betrays you. Now see, Luke just said, because you're a Galilean. But Matthew went on and said, the man said it because his speech. So Peter had to be talking more than just a couple five words for someone to understand his speech is giving him away. So I'm picturing Peter not only sitting there, but joining in the conversation with the people, trying to fit in, while yet watching out for his master. He wanted to be there for Jesus. So with this concerning story, he learns of a failure here. We go on, and now his accent is there. In verse 60, Peter denies his involvement. He says, man, I do not know what you are saying. So that leads us up to this point here. And we know that, uh, I don't want to give the whole story away, but I just have to get to the good part so you don't sit there thinking bad of Peter. Because I like Peter. He's one of my biblical heroes and some of you say, well, you have a whole pocket full. I said, that's right. I can pull out one and talk about it all the time. But today I'm going to talk about Peter. Peter sat there and he did that. And we know he denies Christ three times because a rooster crowed. And the Bible said, and then Peter remembered what Christ said. So that leads me to this point. Failure is not final if, number one, we recognize that every failure, no, number one is we recognize everyone, everyone fails. And who better to show this example than Jesus' right-hand man? Peter. Everyone fails. Honestly, he probably felt like the first time he denied that, don't you think there was something that just burnt through his body? Just a feeling that, oh, just want to make him throw up. Want to take them words and put them back in his mouth. But we know that he didn't do that. And he was still speaking. And we know that in verse 60, at the third denial... That why Peter was denying Christ, it says immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. He didn't even get it out. And Jesus said, see, I told you. But he wasn't doing that. I, I tell you, I, I pondered this. Earlier, people thought Peter was boastful when he said, I would die for you. Uh, Matthew 26, 33 through 35 says, Even if all is made to stumble for you, I will never be made to stumble. Peter said that. Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you this night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. <clears throat> and he said that right to Peter. He looked at Peter and Peter knew he was talking to him. When Jesus said, you will deny me three times, even, Peter says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Now that's some love, isn't it? And then all the other disciples agreed. We, we would die with you too. Well, if Peter will, you know, we, we better follow him. Maybe this is a good thing. And Peter had taught these boys a lot of stuff. And I think it's important for us to know that as Matthew recorded this, that when he said that even if I have to die, I will die, then the other disciples agreed and said, me too. That's important to remember as we go into the story. Peter was so absolutely confident of his loyalty and his strength, but he faltered. He failed. What happened? But I say to you, look in our lives. Don't we sometimes wind up in the same predicament? That we're doing what we think is great. We're out there doing for Jesus and, and something tracks our eye and distracts us. Or 
attacks our heart, someone makes fun of or someone criticizes or something like this and we back up. We were so confident when we left. But when something come against us, we faltered. Now, I shouldn't say you all have faltered, but I can tell you for a personal fact, I have faltered in my life. Praise God, He has given me mercy. <clears throat> when we become distracted from our faith, we will falter. We will falter. And that leads us to point number two. Failure is not final if we remember that God's love and forgiveness is not dependent on our success. Did you hear me? It's not dependent on whether you're successful. God's mercy and his grace and his love and his forgiveness is based upon your love for him and his love to you. Not whether we save or led a hundred people to the Lord, because we can't save anyone. But it's, it's no different than in Peter's day. Peter was to go and, and to start a church, and that's what Jesus was building him up to do, to be a missionary, a church starter, to get out there and start sharing the gospel that Jesus had just gave them in three years. And... Nowhere in the Bible does it say any of the disciples took out a notepad and made notes. Did you ever notice that? And, and, and it's so particular when you're reading the scriptures, when they quote Jesus or they say in, a, in exact order, we went up and there it was, a donkey tied up to a post, just like the Lord said. And... We said to them, the Lord needs of this. And the guy said, go ahead and take it. Just like the Lord said. Why, how do they remember that precise stuff? Because the Holy Spirit embedded that into their heart, into their mind. Remember what Jesus told us when he said that when he gave us a new covenant, he was going to lie it into our hearts and our minds that we will remember and the Holy Spirit draws it out of us in the exact time, in the exact words. When Jesus says, there is no greater love than this. When a man lays down his life and dies for you, you can quote that to someone. And so Jesus said it himself, that you're such a friend to him that he laid down his life and died for you. Is that not what Jesus said? Isn't that something we can tell someone who's struggling and looking for hope? You have a friend in Jesus, no matter what. Because he died and washed all of the sins away before you even got here. Oh, you get so excited. But I want you to know that the Savior who died for you still loves you. Did you hear me? He still loves you no matter if you're successful or not. Take it to the bank. Take anything from today. Remember this. No matter my output, God still loves me. Because He knows our hearts. He knows that we're human, and He knows there's an evil one out there trying to devour us, to destroy us, and to fight against us. He's given us all the tools. But how many times in the Bible do we read that the king had many, many people, many, many soldiers and horsemen and chariots and all this, and while they were sleeping, an angel would walk into their camp and kill 185,000 of them. That's the way God is. He can do anything. Anything. So I want you to remember, the Savior that died for you loves you, even if you fail. Verse 61, it said, the Lord turned to Peter. And I want you to know this is really important. I hope you got this. This is what really hit me good when I was, is that what I should say? 
It just overwhelmed me when I read that Peter and Jesus, Peter was speaking, the rooster crows, the Bible says that Jesus looks at Peter and Peter looks at Jesus. See, that's the key point. They were eyeball to eyeball. And when we look at this, this intense look, we, we heard Luke record that the lady intensely was staring at him. But can you imagine the look on Jesus' face to Peter? What Peter was perceiving when he looked on Jesus? Let's just think Peter's look for a moment, and then I'm going to tell you about Jesus'. But think of Peter looking at Jesus. Don't you think his heart melted? Don't you think he got such a big ball in his throat that he could probably hardly finish his words? And in his eyes, looking back to Jesus, I just imagine Peter was saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But now let's look at Jesus' eyes as he looked into Peter's eyes. Peter had just denied him as he said he would. Now, people would think that Jesus' look would be pretty hard. I think it was hard. I think it was intense. I think it was amazing because I don't think that look was a disappointment. I think it was in compassion. And to know that you're going to overcome this, Peter. There's coming a day that it will be okay that you denied me. It will be okay you failed me. Because the day is coming that you're going to help change the world. And I look at his eyes and, and I think it's a desire that Jesus had to tell him, Peter, it's okay. I still love you. And we know what happens. They go ahead and... And they killed Jesus, but that leads us to our next point here. I, well, I want to make some other points here, I guess. When we're looking at success, I got a couple of quotes that I want to share with you. Uh, Warner uh, Wiseby said, It is to Peter a credit that all the Lord had to do was look at him to bring him to the place of recognition of what he had done and begin repentance. All Jesus had to do was look at him. That, that touched me thinking, all we have to do is look up. And Jesus knows in our heart, we are sorry. And he's saying, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Campbell Morgan said, because no matter how effective, the look of Jesus would have been wasted if Peter had not made contact with Jesus. It would have been all in vain. Except at that exact moment, they both looked at each other. And we know that Peter remembered the words of the Lord and and when the roaster crowed, he remembered hearing them words, you will deny me three times. So failure leads us to point three. We need to learn and grow from our failures. That's what he's telling Peter. It's okay, Peter, but let's learn from this. And we're going to follow that through for a little bit. Because the Bible says that Peter wept bitterly. That means he didn't just cry a little bit. It meant he boohooed, belly cried. He had tears coming from his feet up. He wept bitter, uh, bitterly. That means, according to the Greek translation of, of saying what Peter's tears represented was great remorse. Have you ever cried to the Lord? I have. I've done things that I felt like the Lord has said, 
oh, I really wanted that to happen. And I cried to the Lord. And guess what? He made it available again, and it happened. It happened. With our remorse, we get Chances over chances. Second Corinthians says this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Isn't that powerful words? Paul knew how to say it. Peter knew how to live it. Paul knew how to say it here. That's our lessons today. We're learning some good stuff. And... It's not from the Old Testament, but it's from the Word of God, so we can apply it to our hearts, apply it to our lives, and share it with our neighbors. So you need to share with your friends and your family and your neighbors. Failure is not final. And, and, and Peter learned something here. Peter learned that in his remorse, Jesus still talked to him. That leads me to point number four. Failure's not final. We put our failures behind us. If we don't put them behind us, then we're going to keep falling and falling and falling. He wants us to put it behind us. Each of us at one time or another failed. We, we got to accept that. We even failed the Lord. But when Satan sees that we failed the Lord, he's the first one that comes in and tells you, oh, you're such a failure. Jesus is never going to let you live this one down. Well, let me remind you something. Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. He will deceive you. He will do anything to make you think Jesus doesn't love you. But Jesus loved you so much. He died for you. He died for you. And he said, I took all of my blood and washed away your sins. Don't ever forget that. Everything. Proverbs 24, 16 tells us something amazing too. See, I had to pull some Old Testament in here. It says, though a righteous man may fall seven times, he will rise again. Isn't that some good words? That's a flashcard verse right there. Even though I fail seven times, I will rise again. Man, God loves us so much. Oliver Goldsmith says our greatest story is not never failing, but rising up each time and going for the distance. Rising up. That's exactly what Jesus told Peter. Now we're going to jump ahead and we're going to go to John now. We talked about Peter and Paul and Matthew. And now we're going to get a hold of John. And we talked Luke. So we're covering a lot of the boys here this morning. But I want you to know Jesus kind of reinstated Peter, wouldn't you say? So if we go to John chapter 21, verses 15 through 18. I'm just going to skip some of this. But I want you to read it all. So they had just finished breakfast. This is after Jesus has risen up. And he's walking among. And he's appearing to his disciples. And he's coming again. They've been out fishing all night. And Jesus prepared their breakfast. And they're up on the beach. And and they ate. And they're all fellowshipping. And, And Jesus asked Peter to take a little walk with him. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? More than these. And Simon said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he told him, then Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Now we know lambs are little babies. Feed the children is what he's saying. And then he said to him a little while later, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, he says, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. Well, matter of fact, he said, tend my sheep at that point. Tend my sheep. I'm getting ahead of myself. Meaning, take care of the ones that are here that know me. Tend to them. I'm leaving you kind of in charge. 
This is what Peter kind of took, I think, the in charge moment. That's why he stood up and, and helped his brothers. But listen, it goes on. And then a little while later, he said to him the third time, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter getting a little frustrated now. He said, Lord, you know all things. Now, Peter is getting a little thought back from when he denied Jesus. He says, he's not forgiven me. He's bringing it back up to me. He's using it against me. That's probably what he's thinking. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then he said, feed my sheep. That's the new people. Feed the sheep. And then he said, most certainly, Peter, he said, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will gird you and carry you where you did not wish. And I want you to remember this, that Jesus is saying, Peter, look at your whole life. There was a moment that you just did it all by yourself. There's a moment you did it all by yourself. Now I'm going to wrap up with this. But there comes a time when you felt like you failed. But I have good news for you. You didn't fail. You're going to feed my lambs. You're going to tend my sheep. You're going to feed my sheep. This is not great news. That's for all of us. Jesus says, it's okay. Let's get back to the mission. What's the mission? Making disciples, baptizing them, teaching them all things, and preparing them to what? To go out and share the gospel with someone else. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's what God is telling Peter. He says, Peter, I have forgiven you. Yes, I knew you loved me even when you denied me. You love me. But I wanted to stress to you, three times you denied me, but three times you got to say to me, Lord, I love you. And Jesus probably smiled at him. Now, it doesn't say that, but can't you imagine? Jesus is finally saying, you got it, Peter. You got it. You got it. Theodore Roosevelt, the President of the United States, said, it's far better, it says, far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumph, even though it's checkered by a failure, than to take rank with a poor spirit who never enjoy much nor suffer much, because they lie in the gray twilight never knowing what victory or defeat is. See, through our defeat, it makes our victory grander, greater, whatever we're. So failure is not final if we recognize we all fail. Two, that God's love and forgiveness is not dependent on our success. Three, if we learn and grow from our failure. And four, we put that failure in the past because it's over. And what did Jesus and God both say they do with our sins when they're forgiven? He throws them as far as the east is from the west, never to bring them back up again. So this morning I say to you, Jesus is reminding us he still loves us just the way we are. And if we love Jesus, we'll feed the lambs, we'll tend the sheep, and we'll feed the sheep. So I ask you this morning to remember our greatest glory is not in never failing but it is in the rising each time we fall. Rise up. Carry on. Put your eyes on Jesus, and he'll make it all worthwhile. He loves you.
Let us go to the Lord and pray. Father, I pray this morning that these words will bring comfort and peace to us. That it will help change our lives, Father. Because I pray every time we meet in assembly sharing your word, the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of God from Genesis to Revelation, that we leave changed people. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for mercy and grace. Thank you for Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross. Let that be our motivator, that we are loved. For there's no greater love than when a man lays his life down for his friend. And Jesus called us his friends. Thank you, Lord. But Father, use our failures to equip us to make us better than what we was. That we may serve you more obediently, more effectively. Let us not forget the mission. Let this church stand boldly and say, we will make disciples. Baptize them. We will teach them and train them. And we'll send them out with us to help build the kingdom of God. So, Father, be glorified in all that we say and do, for we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. Hello, this is Pastor Sonny. I just wanted to give you an invitation to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, the Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. So I'm going to pray with you and ask you to pray with me. But the Bible says that if you pray meaning with your heart, that you could be saved. Today could be your day of salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We ask you now to forgive me a sinner. And Lord, that you would take away all my sins. And Father, I pray that you will bless me, Father. And I ask that Jesus will become my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. I believe that he's your son. I believe he died for me. And I believe he rose from the grave, giving me victory over death. I thank you for this gift of eternal life. And I give you my life to you. For I ask in Jesus' name. And amen. Now if you pray that, I'm going to ask you to call our office at 618-462-9523. Or you can email me at nasbc2245 at outlook.com. I want you to know that Jesus loves you and so do we. So please follow up with us as soon as possible so we can help you in your new walk in Jesus. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God.